I know we're reading from John, but I'm going to start off with Luke. In the Gospel according to Luke, in the fourth chapter, Jesus walks into the temple, and he unrolls the scroll, and he reads Scripture. Does anybody know what Scripture he read, reads there? Isaiah, that's right. I heard it. Isaiah. I bet you weren't at the first service. <laughs> oh, you've been at all three services, yes. Isaiah, yes. He reads Isaiah 61, which is our Old Testament reading. So Jesus unrolls the scroll, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me and has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release of the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he closes the scroll, and he sits down, and he says, Today the Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And those people that are listening to them are the educated ones, or the rabbis, and the teachers, and the Pharisees. These are the people that would have listened to what he is saying and recognized, he, oh, he's, he's prophesying something. He's saying he's it. And some people are getting really excited because he's saying he's it. And other people are getting kind of nervous because he's saying he's it. And Jesus is quoting scripture because they would have also recognized that he's talking about something called the year of Jubilee. Does anybody know what that is? That's a harder one, right? Isaiah, we're like, yeah, it's in the Bible. It's about in the middle, right? But the year of Jubilee comes to us from Leviticus 25. And if you want some good rating to go to sleep to tonight, you pull out <laughs> Leviticus 20. You can read any of Leviticus. You're going to snooze really quick. It is a long chapter. It's redundant. It repeats itself a lot. So I'm going to give you the cliff notes about what the year of Jubilee is. It says that every seven times seven years, we will have a year of Jubilee. Okay, mathematicians, what, seven times seven? Very good, very good. Why didn't they just say every 49 years? I'll look that up. And it says that every seven times seven, seven is the number of completion. It is the number of perfection throughout the Bible. And so they want to make sure it's really understood. This is the perfect, perfect thing, the most complete, complete thing. Every seven times seven years is a year of jubilee. And on this day, in this year, if you owed money to anybody and you had debt, it didn't matter where you were at and paying it off, it was wiped clean. If you were a slave or a prisoner, your time was finished. You were free. If you lost your land or you moved away and you owed money to something or other before this property, it was returned back to you. You went back to the ancestral homestead. Everything was brought back to the beginning. It was a do-over. It started again. Everything started fresh. It was a new creation. So Isaiah is writing these words. Jesus is saying these words, and the people that are listening are recognizing something's going on. Now, the reason why Isaiah wrote it is a little bit different from the reason why Jesus is quoting it. Isaiah was talking to a group of people that had just returned from the exile. And you would think after they got home from being gone for generations, would be probably pretty excited to be home, but they're still wondering, where is God in all of this? These are a group of people that are still somewhat hopeless because it's just not the same. Everything is so different now, and they're unfamiliar still. And they're trying to figure out when this Messiah is going to come, and they've been through heartache, and they've been through pain, and they've been through torture, and they've been through enslavement. And now they're back home, and they're trying to figure out how to make things work. And Isaiah gives them these words of hope. And he starts off by saying, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. And there's some pretty important words in there. Number one, he's saying that I have the spirit within me, that the Holy Spirit resides inside of me, that the spirit of God is inside of me. In fact, this God has anointed me. In the Hebrew, the word anointed is Mesha, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. However, it's where we get Messiah from. Messiah literally means anointed one. And so this person is saying, I am part of this. I am anointed. I'm one with the Messiah. I'm waiting on the Messiah. I'm participating with the Messiah until the Messiah should come. That I have the Spirit of God on me. I've been anointed as one with the Messiah. And you can listen to what I have to say because God has... And then he gives seven things. Seven things. He says, number one, that God has sent me to bring good news to those that are oppressed. Number two, to bind up the brokenhearted, these people that have no hope. Number three, to proclaim liberty to the captives, release of the prisoners. Recognize the jubilee happening there? Number four, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Number five, to comfort those who mourn. And the last two have to deal with those that are mourning. 
is to provide clothing for them, a garland, a, a garland or, or a turban or a crown or a, or a robe or, or, or a mantle about their shoulders. And so he's looking at them saying that God has sent me to provide for you this hope so that you would, and then it says, to be called oaks of righteousness, planting for the Lord to display God's glory. An oak of righteousness. Remember, righteousness means a right relationship with God. And so in other words, all of this is putting us in line with God so that way when the Messiah comes, we are ready. And all of us together are now oaks of righteousness, a whole forest filled of righteousness where we stand tall. That means whenever anybody looks at us, they can't help but see God. When everybody hears us speak, they can't help but hear God. When everybody feels our touch, they can't help but feel God. To display God's glory, these oaks of righteousness will build up. And then he talks about the character of God. And you might have already heard this in our liturgy today. It says that God loves justice hates robbery, hates wrongdoing, and is going to build an everlasting covenant with you. It's the same covenant that God built with Abraham. The descendants shall be known among the nations. Remember the, all the descendants like the stars in the heaven that God promises Abraham? He's returning. He's bringing it back down. This is the great do-over. Tell him that you are my people. I'm doing this with you. You oaks of righteousness. It'll happen through you. This is the hope-filled message. And then he talks about this wedding party thing. Listen to what he says. It says that, that God has clothed me with the garments of salvation, covered me with the robe of righteousness, like a bridegroom decks himself with garden, like a bride adorns herself with jewels. This is a, a new creation. Weddings are fun, aren't they? I mean, we all go to weddings. We all have a really good time. This is a great big party is what he's talking about. Weddings are a lot of fun. I mean, unless you're in love with the bride or the groom, then it's not fun for you, but... But weddings are, they're a lot of fun. You go, you have a great time. He's talking about this is going to be the greatest party ever. This is filled with love. It's filled with attention. It's filled with care. And it's for everyone. This is the new creation that he's talking about, giving them hope. The Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before the nation. We are called to share in this mission, to share in this new creation, to share in this Messiah. Isaiah is writing to people that have no hope. And he's providing them with a whole boatload of it. And then we come to our gospel lesson from John. John the Baptist is going down into the river on a daily basis. And he's baptizing people. Because these people too have lost their hope. They're being oppressed. They're wondering when is the Messiah going to come. We've been waiting for generations. It hasn't happened yet. The church is kind of taking power. They're feeling powerless. And John is there to provide them another semblance of hope. And so there he is down in the river, and he's washing them on a daily basis for their forgiveness of sins. Now remember, washing was something that you would do back then to make yourself prepared for something, to make yourself right with something. If you touch something unclean, you would wash to make yourself clean, to make yourself righteous. If you were going to prepare for a festival, you would go weeks early to wash yourself on a daily basis to prepare for that festival, to make sure that you are right with God, to make sure that you are righteous. And so there is John down in this river, which, by the way, it is the dirtiest river. Ooh, we have this place in Alvin called the Chocolate Bayou. That's what I think of every time I hear the River Jordan. It looks like pudding. You know, it's just so dirty. So here is John, and this is the testimony given by John. And the Jews now are sending these priests and these Levites because John's doing some things that he shouldn't be doing. He's not a, he's, he doesn't have the requirements for this. He doesn't have the collar. He, what is he doing down there? He, we haven't told him he can do this. And so they send these, these religious leaders to go down and said, who do you think you are? You think you're the Messiah? And what does John say? No, I am not the Messiah. What are you, Elijah? I'm not Elijah. Are you a prophet? No. Well, who are you? Who gives you the authority to do this? And all of a sudden, John opens up scripture to Isaiah and he says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, which basically says, get ready. God is coming. Be prepared. What are you doing to prepare yourself for it? Make straight the way of the Lord. And then they say, why then are you baptizing? You're not the Messiah. You're not Elijah. You're not a prophet. Why are you doing this? And that's when he says, I'm only baptizing with water. But there's this guy that's coming after me. You don't even know him yet. I can't even untie his shoes. I'm just not worthy of that. See, the thing is, John's baptism is not permanent. 
It's with water. They're coming down on a daily basis to make themselves righteous, to prepare themselves. It's a daily grind for us humans. And John's saying, there's one that's coming that's mightier than I. The Messiah is coming, and he's going to baptize with something far, far greater. And then John says, I am not the Messiah, which is a really good play on words that the Gospel of John uses. Because in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, it is I or I am. How many times do you think he says it? Seven. Seven. You're right. You got it. You're catching on. Yeah. Seven times he says, I am. He is pointing to the one that is. He's given these people hope in a hopeless time. He's inviting them to prepare their hearts and minds for the coming of the Lord to make that path straight. Isaiah is telling us to be oaks of righteousness filled with right relationship with God and with each other. And John is telling us to wash and be ready for whenever. We don't know if it's going to happen today, tomorrow, 100 years from now. That's not the point. The point is, are we ready? Or are we overwhelmed with hopelessness, the brokenness of our world, the wars that are raging, the storms that are happening? Are we so focused on, on ourselves and what we have? Or I was thinking earlier today, I'm like, my gosh, I haven't gotten my sister anything for Christmas yet. In the middle of church, I mean, I f- do, what do we really focus on? Are we hope-filled that the Messiah will come? Are we standing up like these oaks of righteousness, making these paths straight? Or are we stuck in this place where we're just waiting for that voice to call us forth? We're being invited today to stand up and to let our words speak, and to let our actions show, and to let our thoughts display God. Everything that we say, do, and think today has the ability to show God to someone else. That's that straight path. That's that oak of righteousness. Because it's going to happen. The great do-over is going to happen. That cosmic do-over is going to happen. Christ promises, I am coming. Are we prepared? Today's another day that we get to practice it. Amen.